Thank you for joining us today for another presentation of Let the Bible Speak with your speaker, Brett Hickey. Welcome to Let the Bible Speak. The topic of angels is cheering or chilling, depending on your standing with God. You see, angels serve not only God, but they serve the heirs of salvation, Christians. The Spirit tells of the angel's role in judgment in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning with verse 6. It is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you, and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. I do not ordinarily think about angels being materially involved in the rest given to troubled believers and the vengeance meted out to those who do not obey the gospel. But that's precisely what the Bible says. This alone makes the work of angels worthy of our consideration. I've known otherwise knowledgeable Christians who knew little about angels some who doubted their existence or even denied their work among Christians entirely. That is sad. While much about the work of angels I do not understand, we can know what they have done under the Old Testament. And even in New Testament times, we can find and take solace in the fact that they still have a work to do today that involves God's people. I've not preached on the topic of angels as much as I should have. I rarely hear others teach on the subject. I think that's a mistake because whenever a Bible topic is neglected, there is a tendency for the vacuum to be filled with popular but erroneous ideas. Some just spread by the culture and others spread by false teachers. Take note of the fact that the words angel and angels are found in nearly 300 scriptures in the Bible, with 178 of those scriptures in the New Testament and 105 of those scriptures in the Old Testament. Did you get that? The words angel and angels are found nearly twice as much in the New Testament as they are in the Old. 52 of those 178 New Testament instances are from the Gospels. 53 are from the book of Revelation. These facts certainly make the subject relevant for our exploration. The work of angels after our song. There's a happy land of promise over in the great beyond where the saved are shall sing the glory share where the souls of men shall enter and live on forevermore everybody will be happy over there everybody will be happy over there everybody will be happy over there people shall be saved shall sing the 
while we should be enthusiastic about the study of angels, we should be careful not to fill in blanks the scriptures leave empty. That's very common today. As with the Holy Spirit, some imaginative, overzealous Bible students attribute to angels details of which scripture is silent. The Bible teaches in Proverbs 30, verse 6, do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. I'm also reminded of Deuteronomy 29, verse 29. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever. We will focus on the details scriptures do provide. First, though, because the scriptures say so much about angels and our time is limited, let's consider a general discussion regarding angels from the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia. The word angel is applied in Scripture to an order of supernatural or heavenly beings whose business it is to act as God's messengers to men and as agents who carry out His will. Both in Hebrew and Greek, the word angel is applied to human messengers, 1 Kings 19, verse 2, Luke 7, 24. In Hebrew, it is used in the singular to denote a divine messenger and in the plural for human messengers, although there are exceptions to both usages. It is applied to the prophet Haggai, Haggai 1, verse 13, to the priest, Malachi 2, verse 7, and to the messenger who is to prepare the way of the Lord, Malachi 3, verse 1. In the New Testament, the word agalos, when it refers to a divine messenger, is frequently accompanied by some phrase which makes the meaning clear. For example, the angels of heaven, Matthew 24, verse 36. Angels belong to the heavenly host, Luke 2, verse 13. In reference to their nature, angels are called spirits in Hebrews 1, verse 14. Paul evidently referred to the ordered ranks of supramundane beings in a group of words that are found in various combinations, namely archai, or principalities, exousiae, powers, thronai, thrones, curiotitis, dominions, and dunamis, also translated powers. The first four are apparently used in a good sense in Colossians 1.16, where it said that all these beings were created through Christ and unto him. In most of the other passages in which words from this group occur, they seem to represent evil powers. We are told that our wrestling is against them, Ephesians 6.12, and that Christ triumphs over the principalities and powers, Colossians 2.15, Romans 8.38, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 24. In two passages, the word translated archangel or chief angel occurs, the voice of the archangel, 1 Thessalonians 4.16, and Michael the archangel, Jude 1, verse 9. Everywhere in the Old Testament, the existence of angels is assumed. The creation of angels is referred to in Psalm 148, verse 2 and 5. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. As to their outward appearance, it's evident that angels could at times be mistaken for men. Ezekiel 9, verse 2, Genesis 18, verse 2 and 16. There is no hint that they ever appeared in female form. Angels are messengers and instruments of the divine will. Two angels are commissioned to destroy Sodom, Genesis 19, verse 13. When David numbers the people, an angel destroys them by pestilence, 2 Samuel 24, verse 16. It is by an angel that the Assyrian army is destroyed, 2 Kings 19. In this connection, it should be noted the expression angels of evil, angels that bring evil upon men from God and execute his judgments, Psalm 78, verse 49. He casts on them the fierceness of his anger, wrath, indignation, and trouble by sending angels of destruction among them. The idea of angels as caring for men also appears, 
Psalm 91, verse 11, and the following verses. Although the modern conception of the possession by each man of a special guardian angel is not found in the Old Testament. Angels are stronger, 2 Samuel 24, verse 16. They're more intelligent, Daniel 9, verse 21 and 22, and swifter, Daniel 9, 21, than any mere man. As to the outward appearance of angels, allow me to add the popular image of a cute little angel does not match the intimidating presence that Scripture portrays. Almost without exception, the first words an angel speaks to a human is, Fear not. In Luke 1 verse 12, when Zechariah saw an angel, the Bible says he was troubled and fear fell upon him. Then in Luke 2 verse 9, the scriptures say, And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before the shepherds, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. These angels weren't cute. When the angel appeared to Mary Magdalene and the other Mary at Jesus' tomb, the Bible says, His countenance was like lightning, and his clothing as white as snow, and the guard shook for fear of him and became like dead men. When an angel appeared to the Apostle Paul in Acts 27, 24, he said, Do not be afraid, Paul. Isaiah responded with these words in Isaiah 6. Woe is me, for I am undone. When he was confronted with the presence of angels. And Daniel trembled in Daniel 10. We know angels worship God and serve God. But what about angels? who are higher creatures than man. Do these higher-ranking beings actually serve men? Yes, angels are higher than man. The Bible says in Hebrews 2, verse 9, but we see Jesus, who as creator was, of course, higher as God through eternity, Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. Christ's condescension to take on flesh, to suffer, and to die for the sins of mankind is overwhelming. But we see that this concern and condescension for unworthy mankind doesn't stop with Jesus. Notice the blessing revealed in Hebrews 1, verse 14. Are they angels? Not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? That angels are spirits that minister or serve comes as no surprise. But did you realize that God sends angels to minister or serve those who will inherit salvation? That's precisely what the Bible says. Understanding this truth gives those away from God one more reason to serve God. But the natural question is, what does that mean? How exactly do angels serve those who will inherit salvation? Now, the New Testament does not provide many specific details along those lines, but we can see a number of ways throughout history, biblical history, that angels have served man. We need to pause, though, and note how highly God views serving. Jesus came saying he came not to be served and then backed up his teaching in the most tangible way when he got down on his knees and washed his disciples' filthy feet. And so one of the ways we know we're getting closer to God is when we find ourselves serving others more readily and with a smile. Satan would certainly have been averse to serving man. In fact, as our adversary, we know he's doing everything in his power to see that we wallow in our sin and ultimately make our eternal home in the lake of fire with him and his angels. And so often, pride is central to that work. So let's reflect. Which type of angelic beings are you most closely modeling your life after? 
those that serve others, or those that influence others to move away from Jesus and recoil at the idea of serving. After delineating some of the facts of the gospel plan, the apostle indicates in 1 Peter 1 verse 12 that these details deeply intrigue the angels, perhaps because of their greater intelligence and intimacy in heaven with God. The angels that sinned once forfeited forever the bliss of heaven. No grace, no mercy, no forgiveness, no plan of salvation was extended to angels as has been extended to man. Jesus shares the angels' jubilation, though, on man's behalf in this regard amidst his parables of the lost sheep, the lost coin and the lost son. Remember what Jesus says in Luke 15, 10? There is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Today, if you're not right with God and you decide to turn your life over to God as insignificant as you may feel that you are, you will set the angels in heaven to rejoicing. What a glorious thought. Burton Kaufman points out that the holy angels demonstrate their great concern over the welfare of man when they praise God over the fields of Bethlehem, where the shepherds were to whom it was announced that a Savior was born, Luke 2, 2 verse 13. Also, when an angel announced to Mary that she would be the mother of the Messiah, Luke 1, verse 26, and then when an angel declared to the shepherds that he was born, Luke 2, verse 10. In addition, the angel Gabriel appeared to Zacharias to tell him that he and his wife Elizabeth, though childless and well advanced in years, would be blessed with a son they will name John, who will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Luke 1, 15 through 17. The angels are more involved in what we read in scripture sometimes than we realize. Angels were fully engaged in introducing the good news in the gospels. The angel Gabriel came to Mary while she was a virgin to tell her, Luke 1, 28, rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. The angel Gabriel also told her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary expressed concern. Can you imagine as a young lady getting this news from an angel? She said, how can this be since I do not know a man? The angel Gabriel explained that she would give birth to the Son of God by means of a miracle through the Holy Spirit. You see, angels were heavenly involved and what was going on. Much later, we see the work of angels at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Jesus, you remember, had been fasting 40 days and 40 nights when Satan tempted him. He was worn out, exhausted from hunger and this grueling experience. The Bible says, listen to this, angels came and ministered to him. We don't know exactly what they did, but no doubt the angels somehow refreshed and strengthen Jesus. Then towards the end of Jesus' earthly ministry, Jesus prayed that heart-wrenching prayer in which he asked, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Luke adds, then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. Jesus, the Son of God, benefited 
from the strengthening power given him by an angel. When a Christian prays, we cannot say for certain how the Lord answers that prayer, but perhaps he uses an angel. When Mary stood outside Jesus' tomb weeping, two angels in white appeared unto her. Sitting one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain and spoke to her asking why she was weeping. Then when the disciples witnessed Jesus ascending into heaven, two men in white apparel, surely angels, told them, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Historically, part of the work and ministry of angels has been to defend and protect God's people. In the Old Testament, God pronounced the special care he provides his people in Psalm 91, verses 1 through 12. Notice he uses the angels in offering this comforting service. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in him I will trust. A little later, he shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. A little later, because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the most high, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. He shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Of course, this blessing is general in nature. God never intended his people to think that they would be completely spared of all difficulties. When tempting Jesus, Satan went so far, in fact, in twisting this passage that he suggested to Jesus, that he would be rescued by angels if he jumped off the pinnacle of the temple. Jesus exposed Satan's perversion by quoting another scripture. You shall not tempt the Lord your God. The Holy Spirit teaches similarly in Psalm 34, verse 7. The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. Angels rescued Lot from Sodom and Gomorrah. Genesis 19. An angel opened the prison doors for the apostles when they were imprisoned by the Jews, Acts 5, verse 19. And in answer to the prayers of the church, an angel appeared to Peter when he was in prison, facing certain death by Herod, and set him free, Acts 12, verse 7. Once set on burning to a crisp, the three faithful Hebrew young men who rebelled against him Nebuchadnezzar later issued overflowing praise to God, saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. They have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Later we find Daniel thrown into the lion's den for faithfully praying to God. When the king's edict, prohibited it. He praised God in Daniel 6, verse 22, for sending his angel to shut the lion's mouths so that they have not hurt him. In the New Testament, an angel appeared to Cornelius, a Roman centurion, and instructed him to send men to Joppa for Simon Peter, who would tell him what he must do to be saved, Acts 10. Notice even the age of the apostles when angels interacted directly with the lost, a sinner still had to hear from his fellow man what he needed to do to be saved. Angels didn't teach the plan of salvation. Finally, one of the more meaningful scenes associated with angels comes when Jesus, in telling the story of the rich man and Lazarus, says that when Lazarus died, he was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The idea that such may still happen should be a great comfort. We'll be right back after our song. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King.
please join us every Lord's Day for Let the Bible Speak, and then gather with us for worship at one of the congregations listed shortly. You can contact us to receive a copy of 1463, The Work of Angels. We welcome your questions or comments on this issue or any other Bible topic. You can request the Truth Freeze Bible Study Course. You may also review video, audio, and transcripts of over 500 Bible messages at LetTheBibleSpeak.com. We close with the words the Apostle Paul issued in Romans 16, verse 16. The churches of Christ salute you. Until next week, goodbye, and may God bless you.